I love games with unforgettable allies. That feeling you get when you team up with a new character gets me every time. Getting Orin to join permanently in Final Fantasy X, meeting a new partner in Paper Mario back when it was, you know, good. Or Drachma from Skies of Arcadia. Oop, oh, nope, never mind. Oh, you're back. Great. Oh. Okay. In a lot of turn-based games, your party members were an extension of yourself. You'd have full control over what they do on their turn. In lots of more action-based games, however, you can't control your whole team at once. So you need to rely on AI to control your allies. Designing and fine-tuning their automated behavior can make or break an entire game. If they're too useful or powerful, you risk them playing the game for you. If they're too weak or ineffective, they could become an unintentional liability, or you might forget that they're even there. In a perfect world, these characters should feel like they make a real contribution without stealing the fun from the player. That's easy to say, but clearly there are pitfalls everywhere. Let's look at how some games approach AI companion design successfully and unsuccessfully, and talk about how both the mechanics and the story of a game can influence AI design. There's an idea in psychology called loss aversion that says that losing something feels more negative than gaining it feels positive. One way to design an AI around loss aversion is instead of depending on a character and being disappointed if they fail to help, switch it up and have an AI character occasionally give out bonuses. Just framing the player's expectations differently can make them happier, even if they're getting the same benefits on average either way. The Palicos of Monster Hunter World are a good example of how to design around loss aversion. Palicos are great at distracting monsters and creating opportunities during fights. They don't do much damage, but they make up for it in utility and customization. They can be equipped with status-inflicting weapons and special palico tools that can heal you, give you buffs, set up traps, or they can even steal monster materials. They will use these skills on their own, but you can command them manually if you want to. There's no major penalty if they run out of health either. They have autonomy without being a liability. Some palico equipment loadouts are better than others, but they all provide at least some benefit, but never so much that they make the monster hunting at the core of the game too easy. If Monster Hunter framed Palicos as allies that did a major part of the monster hunting, the same behaviors would feel disappointing. But since they're more of a companion that gives out bonuses, and they only show up when you don't have many actual players in your party, they feel like good partners. They're great during the beginning of the game while you figure out the ropes, and they don't get in the way of high-end monster hunting. And above all, it's a cat. It's adorable. Don't overthink it. There's a murky middle ground for AI design that you can see in Kingdom Hearts. One of the running jokes with Kingdom Hearts 1 and 2 was that Donald and Goofy were the poster boys for useless companions. I revisited Kingdom Hearts 1 and I was surprised in the early game. They actually did more than I ever gave them credit for. They'll automatically attack enemies, using offensive and support skills to help you out. You can also use the triangle button to send them after a specific target that you're locked onto. They do well enough against the fodder in the early game, but once tougher enemies and bosses come into the picture, they just can't keep up. Unlike the Palicos, Donald, Goofy, and the various guest party members don't create many opportunities for you during fights. They can't really evade or block attacks well, they waste MP by whiffing attacks, and they'll take slivers away from the enemy's health while Sora takes out huge chunks with each hit. They don't know how to protect themselves and will quickly burn through any items you give them. When they're not doing chip damage or wasting items, they're probably unconscious. They end up being much more useful if you customize their skills and behaviors to focus on support skills like MP Gift and Cure. It's nice that the game is flexible enough to let you do that, but it's a little disappointing to have to override some bad AI if you want Donald and Goofy to be as useful as I think the game intended them to be. Kingdom Hearts 2 tried to make them more useful in combat with the limits and drive forms that require your party members to perform, and it helps a bit, but they still can't do that much on their own. They also took out most of the support abilities and the AI control, so even going back to the strategies you used in Kingdom Hearts 1 isn't as effective anymore. The AI feels like wasted potential, requiring too much handholding to be effective, but they're not so useless as to break the game. Luckily, Kingdom Hearts 3 fixes a lot of the series' AI problems. Your party members will do decent damage this time. There are new team combo finishers that trigger if they're nearby, the game has lots of customization options like Kingdom Hearts 1, and special limit commands like Kingdom Hearts 2. Your party feels more complete, strategically anyway. This might be a good spot to find 
Mm -hmm. Thanks. Ally design can also become a problem if you don't properly frame what the AI members should be responsible for. In Star Fox Assault, there's a disconnect between what the game says the AI characters are there for and what the game actually does with them. Star Fox is supposed to be a team of space mercenaries. Emphasis on team, but it's mostly just the Fox McCloud show. Let's use the third mission of Star Fox Assault as an example. In this all-range map, you have to infiltrate a space station to take out a number of enemy spawners. While you look for them, enemy ships will periodically spawn outside of the station. As more ships appear, a meter will fill up and if it maxes out, the mission will fail. Your teammates will either help you on foot in the station or fend off the enemies outside in our wings. Heh, <laughs> just kidding. They're just flying around in circles taking random pot shots. Or firing at me. You'll have to go outside yourself to clear the area before the meter maxes out. Your ally on the ground can actually hold their own, kinda like an auto turret, but they'll only stay within a very small space. Scripted events will show your wingmates being useful, but the second they're needed in the actual game, it turns out they're really just there for show. The framing of the role of your wingmates is confusing, and makes the situation feel like a missed opportunity. Ace Combat 7 has exactly the same problem actually, but in every mission. The series gives you wingmates every game, and Ace Combat 5 even lets you guide their behavior. Ace Combat 7, however, has teammates that take random shots at random targets, and you have no way of making them do anything else. Very, very rarely will your wingmates take out any of the mission-critical targets marked in red. Instead, you might see them pick off a non-critical target once in a while. Or maybe just nothing. It's the same problem as Star Fox. But it's a strange regression for a series that had more or less fixed the problem in an earlier game. If this makes you think that maybe you know better than the AI programmers, and you should just make the AI yourself, you should try Final Fantasy XII. The Gambit system in FF12 lets you program exactly the steps, or gambits, that your AI party members will take in battle in a kind of Lego brick sort of way. For example, you can set a gambit to have a character cast healing spells whenever someone's HP drops below a set threshold, or automatically cast haste on the party whenever you can. More advanced and specific conditions for gambits can be found in shops as the game progresses. You also have to consider the priorities of your gambits, placing more situational instructions at the top and common ones at the bottom. If you have attacking nearby enemies as a top priority, the other gambits will never be used. It's not that far off in concept from what an actual AI programmer might code, but this way you feel like you're in control if the AI screws something up. Even though the Gambit system needs micromanaging like in Kingdom Hearts, the framing is completely different. Managing Gambits is a huge part of the game, so it's not as frustrating as the micromanaging was in Kingdom Hearts. Players expect it, so they're okay with putting in the time. The idea of what a player expects a character to do is pretty central to AI design. But an AI's expectations can also overlap with the game's story. The narrative of a game can make an AI character behave unexpectedly, but there is a way to do it that won't frustrate players as much. God of War 4's story is all about the father-son relationship between Kratos and Atreus. The developers at Santa Monica designed Atreus to always feel like he was contributing during combat. He can shoot arrows and summon creatures on your command with a single button. He'll follow up on your attacks when he's nearby, and he can distract and stun enemies and open them up for you. You don't have the micromanage him beyond equipping stat boosting gear and occasionally saving him when he gets caught by an enemy. Atreus also acts as your hint guide and helps you solve puzzles. He's not treated like an escort character, but the game does turn him into a liability in combat to fit with some of the story beats. In a later section of the game, Atreus won't always listen to your commands and will recklessly lead you into bad situations. He'll even start using the special summon attacks on his own regardless if it's well-timed or not. For some, the sequence can come off as rushed, but it's a deliberate choice, and it's an effective way to tie together an antagonistic AI character in the story with their behavior in the gameplay. Deltarune also uses AI-controlled allies as part of its narrative with Susie. Susie's deliberately designed to be a headache for your party and unlike Atreus, this happens over most of the game. If you're an Undertale veteran, you'll probably try to play through the game as a pacifist. Susie, the bully of the group, will make life tough for your pacifist playstyle by automatically attacking whatever you fight. It adds an interesting wrinkle to combat since you have to account for Susie's violent actions, if you want to get through battles peacefully. 
It's very easy to circumvent though, as it's meant more as a characterization device instead of a real gameplay challenge. The battle system in Deltarune is treated more like an extension of the story, and to that end Susie's behavior in battle and how it changes over time is an interesting way of progressing her story arc. With a good story-driven reason, even the most annoying character actions can have purpose and make the game better. But without a reason, there's nothing left to counter the raw annoyance that uncontrollable bad actions inherently have. I love Persona 3, but the biggest problem with the console releases of the game is your uncontrollable party members. It's rare for a traditional turn-based JRPG to not give you full control, and the console versions of Persona 3 show why. Things can go south real fast in Shin Megami Tensei's press turn system. In it, you take away enemy turns by hitting them with elemental weaknesses. Your opponents will also try to do the same to you. You can only fully control your main character and if you're hit with an elemental weakness, you lose your only turn that combat round. You can give your allies broad commands like conserve SP or focus on weaknesses, but you can only change these commands during your turn so you can't always micromanage them if you need to. This can lead to some ugly scenarios where you're at the mercy of not just the enemy AI, but also your allies. Sometimes the party will cast the spell you need them to. Other times they cast Marin Karen, which will probably miss and lead to your death. And to add a horrible twist to the situation, if your main character's HP hits zero for any reason, it's game over. The AI can lead to a frustrating death and it's a big reason why I sometimes hesitate to recommend Persona 3 over its sequels. AI design is hard to do. Developers have to find the balance between an AI that feels like a help without taking over the game. Between an AI that takes input from players, but still doesn't need their handheld all the time. Lots of games get the balance wrong for lots of reasons, but by learning from mistakes made in the past, taking some cues from psychology, and setting expectations properly, you can turn an AI into an ally.